Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry to keep you all waiting. Um, my name is Scott Wall. I'm the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost here at UCLA, and I um, have to say this is a wonderful occasion, and it's uh, doubly pleasurable, or it's pleasurable in two different directions. Uh, one, first of all, is to be able to celebrate the generosity of our donors. Um, we in, uh, in the university and everybody increasingly depends upon the generosity of our friends, family, relatives, and uh, alumni, and it's extraordinarily important. And it's extraordinarily, extraordinarily important that that generosity recognizes that it is important to support the faculty in ways that are very meaningful. Creating a chair is one of the most meaningful ways we can support the faculty. It not only gives a title to the faculty member, also provides resources to the faculty to departments, and it's extraordinarily important. So that generosity, that connection to the public, that connection to our friends is really important, and I'm glad that we can celebrate it today. And I'm particularly glad that we can celebrate Hollis Landerking and his visionary, a visionary alumnus who understands the meaningful and in, uh, very important ways in which philanthropy can aid the university and keep university great, UCLA great. It's really important, increasingly important. You may know that Mr. Lander King has been extraordinarily generous, and his generosity has reached to all corners of the campus, including the library, athletics, the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, I have to read this because it's so long, and the college's greatest needs fund. And he established the John Muir Memorial Endowed Chair in Geography, which is, I think, a kind of signal. It's really nice because it, it links two things, the uh, tradition of John Muir in California and the Department of Geography and the uh, work that the Department of Geography does. So on the one side, this is really a great occasion because you get to honor the kind of support that we get from our closest friends and our generous friends. On the other side, it's important because it recognizes the quality that that generosity supports and sustains. And so we're very pleased. I think it's really great that uh, Niall Green uh, is uh, here honored as the inaugural holder of the Ibn Khaldun Endowed Chair in World History. The title itself is important because it recognizes a renowned Arab historian, historiographer and uh, historian. and. Um, brings together, I think, a lot of things which are very important in the history department today, which is world history and an understanding of the global interconnections that make the world what it is, has, it, has been in the past and what it is today. And uh, I can't think of anybody better to represent those uh, trends than Niall Green. So this is, a, as I said, a doubly gratifying occasion, on the one hand, to honor uh, Mr. Lander King and his uh, uh, generosity, and on the other, to honor Niall Green and his work that uh, places him in this chair. So congratulations to you both, and congratulations to the History Department. And now I'll turn it over to Darnell Hunt, the Dean of Social Sciences, who's far more articulate and knows more about these things than I do. <laughs> Darnell. And now I have to go back to a meeting. I'm sorry. Well, actually, Provost Waugh has said everything that needs to be said. So good evening, I'm Darnell Hunt, Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, and I'm proud to be here to celebrate the installation of Professor Niall Green as the inaugural chairholder of the Ibn Khaldun Chair in World History. Now the chair, as uh, Provost Waugh just told us, was generously established by Hollis Lenderking, an alumnus of the History Department. There you go, <laughs> warrant, the, warrant the clap. Who has been a dedicated supporter of research and education at UCLA for many years. To you, Hollis, I offer my deepest gratitude and thanks. As you know, the UCLA History Department is among the best in the world, comprised of leading scholars who are educating and ins inspiring the next generation. UCLA History is a department that not only excels in research and teaching here at UCLA, but one that also enthusiastically embraces our mission to the public through their ongoing dialogue with the wider campus and community, informing us all on why history matters. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Department of History, Carla Pasana. Good evening. Um, as Dean Hunt, said, um, I'm Carla Pistana, Chair of the History Department, and uh, I'm also an alumnus of this department. I was a graduate student here some years ago. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all today. As a chairholder myself, 
I know the honor and the importance of being appointed to an endowed chair. Endowed chairs provide sustained and critical resources for research te and teaching to the chairholder. They allow us to support our graduate students, they allow us to travel. Um, the research we do here in the UCLA History Department and the next generation of scholars that we train in large, large, complex uh, problems that are as relevant today as ever. I would like to express my gratitude to Hollis uh, Linder King for his conviction and generosity in establishing the Caldoun Chair, which is a testament of faith in the importance to the work that we do here in the History Department and more broadly at UCLA. And so we're very grateful to you for your support. Niall Green is recognized as a leading historian of the multiple globalizations of Islam and of Muslims. Last year, he was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship, one of the highest honors a scholar can receive. His books and articles have traced Muslim networks that connect South and Central Asia with the Middle East, the Indian Ocean, Africa, Japan, and the United States. The New York Times book reviews selected one of his recent publications, The Love of Strangers, What Six Muslim Students Learned in Jane Austen's London as an Editor's Choice Book Selection. Among his, most, among his many accomplishments and contributions, Niall was founding director of the UCLA Program of Central Asia, where he served for eight years. He has also served on various editorial and advisory boards, including the International Journal of Middle East Studies. And I personally am very pleased to have Niall as one of my colleagues and uh, a fellow faculty member in the History Department. So it is my very great pleasure to introduce Niall Green, the Ibn Khaldun Chair in World History. Well, I have a series of important thanks to give as well. First of all, of course, to Hollis Lender King. Thank you, Hollis. My thanks also to Scott Waugh, to Darnell Hunt, and to Carla Pastana for these generous introductions. And also thanks to those of my colleagues who voted for me and, in fact, elected me to, to this chair. I'm very honored to be here, and not least uh, in reflection of Hollis's vision and generosity in allowing this chair to be named, not after himself, but after the great medieval historian, Ibn Khaldun. It's also a very great pleasure to be standing here pretty much 12 years to the day since I uh, gave my job talk at UCLA. And uh, I might confess, wearing the same suit. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the unusual event, many of my colleagues will know. So let me give a, a short outline of what I'll be talking about today. First of all, I'd like to give some definitions. What is world history? And who was Ibn Khaldun? What did he have to do with world history? Then I'd like to develop the problem I hinted at in the subtitle of my lecture title, The Historian's Dilemma of Scale. And then in the main part of my talk today, I'd like to give some answers to suggest three ways, and at least I as a historian, have tried to respond to that dilemma. First then to definition. Well, world history is not, at least not necessarily, the history of the whole world, though that hasn't stopped many people trying to write that. <laughs> world history is an approach, or a method, or an ethos. It's easiest to define in a negative way. World history is not nation-based. It doesn't take the nation-state or national communities as its focus or unit of analysis. According to the World History Association, world historians use a wide spatial lens, though they do not always take the entire world as their unit of analysis. They tend to de-emphasize individual nations or civilizations and focus instead on regions defined differently, including zones of interaction or the ways in which people, goods, and ideas moved across regions through migration, conquest, and trade. My own definition is somewhat shorter. World history is the study of processes that are intrinsically interregional, that unfold across geographical, ethnic, linguistic, or political boundaries. To my mind, that at least points to the added value of world history, that it captures processes that are missed by other 
local or national optics. But it doesn't seek to replace national history. It just does something different. For this reason, the question of scale, of non-national scales, is central to the endeavor. But as I'll argue, a world historical scale is not necessarily larger than the analytical scale of national history, a world in a grain of sand. So how does Ibn Khaldun fit into this? Well, as the field, the professional field, at least of world history developed from the 1960s, it sought a genealogy. Would the mythical founder, so to speak, of world history be Herodotus? Or was that far to European in orientation? Perhaps it was Sima Qian, the ancient Chinese historian. Then there were various medieval universal historians who were suggested as candidates. Perhaps Rashid al-Din, the Jewish convert to Islam, vizier of the Mongols, and author of the Jami al-Tawarikh, the compendium of histories. Others proposed Ibn Khaldun, and I supported the, the naming of this chair as Ibn Khaldun as well. Why? Because Ibn Khaldun was a theorist or a methodologist and not merely a chronicler. But as such, he still speaks to many 20th and 21st century historians, including two figures I'll be talking about in my, my lecture today, Arnold Toynbee and Marshall Hodson. Moreover, to my mind, Ibn Khaldun is an appropriately worldly figure, a Muslim born on the African continent, writing in Arabic, one of the great languages of world history. His magnum opus was the Kitab al-Ibar, the Book of Admonishing Lessons. Though today, of the seven volumes, the seven long volumes of which that is composed, he's most famous for its introduction. The word is muqaddima in Arabic. And it was in that muqaddima, in that introduction, that he laid out his most famous idea, one of his many ideas of the importance of social formations in defining the events of history. The idea was asabir, group solidarity, a term that in itself earned him in the 20th century the title of founding sociologist. But he was also a world historian. The other volumes which are now languishing in the YRL and elsewhere, rarely been republished since their original translation in the uh, 1950s, comprised a world history from antiquity up to his own period, the 14th century. He died in 1406. And that points to what I'll call response one, to the dilemma of scale in world history. And that response is to write all that's known, the history of all peoples, all dynasties, all states. And if you're a historian of the caliber of Ibn Khaldun at least, then to try to extract some general theories. But let me further develop the problem, the dilemma, by pointing to the accumulative character of historical knowledge. In simple terms, that over the centuries, certainly since Ibn Khaldun's time, more has happened to more people in more places. Ibn Khaldun was in some sense fortunate that in his own day, remember he died in 1406, the Americas and Australasia were entirely unknown to old world historians like himself. By the 20th century, of course, all that had changed. World historians, as they evolved in the 20th century, most famously, Arnold Toynbee, the 20th century's most famous world his, uh, historian altogether, appearing on the front page of Time magazine, among other things, took an encyclopedic approach to world history. Toynbee's venture, a study of history, eventually reached into 12 volumes of around 3 million words that took him 30 years to write. And over that period, in which he tried to get a grip, a grasp on all of the events of world history by containing world history into a series of civilizations. Even his list of civilizations kept growing. Ultimately, there were 28, more than the actual number of volumes that he wrote. He traced then world history as a series of civilizational stories of genesis to disintegration, a cyclical pattern that made him one of the 20th century's numerous admirers of Ibn Khaldun, who similarly wrote of history in cyclical terms. But since Toynbee died in 1961, that accumulative dilemma of historical knowledge has been massively magnified by the rise of area studies in the 1960s, in the 1960s, since when we've come to know much more about the history of Africa, of Central Asia, of Southeast Asia, of the Americas, and recognize their importance to the history of the world and indeed to the project of world history. The rise in the 1970s and 80s of polycentric histories, as scholars from Asia and Africa heeded the call to move beyond Eurocentrism, a term itself founded in the 
in the 1980s by writing histories centered in other parts of the world than Europe. And then more recently, from the late 1990s, the rise of big history, of writing histories that begin with the Big Bang, no less, scales that make Toynbee's and Ibn Khaldun's scale look positively provincial. Then the problem was increased in some ways by the diversification of the discipline through the rise of social history in the 1960s. The history should no longer be about the states, rulers, and civilizations written about by Toynbee, but should, of course, to the great benefit of the discipline, also be about all of the lower classes of history. The rise then of gender and subaltern histories from the 1970s and, and 80s in the wake of social history, again, broadened uh, the compass of history. And since then, in the 1990s and 2000s, the rise of environmental and more recently animal history have again increased the dilemma of scale by making the accumulative character of history much larger now than even human history beyond the human species. There's also a rising and as yet unmet challenge that of big data of how historians might master computer-aided methods to write big histories as world histories. Such is the world historian's dilemma then. The need to master, on the one hand, the infinite library imagined by Jorge Luis Borges in his 1941 story, The Library of Babel, or at the other extreme of condensing and abstracting a method taken to its reductio ad, uh, ad absurdum by Douglas Adams, the science fiction writer, when he claimed that the answer to the meaning of life, the universe, and everything was the number 42. <laughs> Those two extreme parameters, Borges' infinite library and Adams' ultimate abbreviation, haven't stopped historians from writing large-scale surveys in recent years. One might point to C.S. Bailey's Birth of the Modern World, or more recently, Jürgen uh, Oesterhamel's Transformation of the World. But both of these books, very thick tomes and erudite tomes as they are, nonetheless only deal with the long 19th century. Across the larger chronological scale, two opposite tendencies have emerged. One, what I'd call hypercondensation. Books in the wake, I must say, of UCLA's own Jared Diamond with his guns, germs, uh, and steel, authors such as David Christian in his book Maps of Time, creating the discipline or the subdiscipline of world history that points back history as being a development since the Big Bang, or more recently Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, works which attempt to write histories on the largest chronological scale, and indeed the largest scale beyond indeed human histories as well, in only 400 pages. In Harari's case, more modest, only trying to write the history of 70,000 BC for the present. But then there's been another tendency, particularly within the academy, of multi-author collections. One might think of the new Oxford world history, currently standing around 25 volumes of thematical and regional world histories written by a whole range of authors. Or the Cambridge world history, published or completed a couple of years ago in seven volumes of nine fat books, comprising the contributions of around 150 different authors. And while these are great achievements, I'd suggest that they often conflate world histories with universal history. Remember, world history is an approach, not necessarily a scale. It's about exploring connectivity, interdependence, complex causality. And therefore, world history can use the small scale as a means of demonstrating large processes. Microhistory, then, isn't the antithesis of world history, but rather one of its aid, aids. It's possible, then, to flip the scale of analysis and use the micro as an, mac as an optic of the macro, to use the micro, indeed, as a means of seeing or digesting macro processes. That, after all, is the epistemological theme of William Blake's verse that I quoted in the first half of my lecture title, A World in a Grain of Sand. And Blake's verse also points us to the aesthetic dimensions of history, the importance, I think, of maintaining a human scale and a human-centered, non-deterministic histori historiography that recognizes constantly human agency. 
something that even Ibn Khaldun, struggling as he was with a theistic model of the world, was determined to hang on to. So having defined that dilemma, the historian's dilemma of scale, I'd like to point to some of the ways in which I've tried in my own work to approach world history without resorting to the universal history mode. I've got no desire to write 20 volumes like John did in one work. And I'd like to show how I've done this by drawing on some micro-historical approaches and various insider and outsider uh, concepts, some emic and etic concepts. I'll explain those words as I move on. Three routes, then, from the micro to the macro, or three ways of seeing a world in a grain of sand. Through sources, I'll explore two of those. Concepts, I'll look at two of those. And a process, I'll look at one of those. Well, let me f turn first to a source or shared source, the shrine and hagiography, the shrine and biography of Shah Musafir, a figure, a text, and a figure who featured in my PhD dissertation in my first book. As a graduate student, I found my way down to South India in a town called Aurangabad, a small Indian town, only around a million people. And I settled upon studying several different shrines. One of them was this one here, which I thought, in fact, when I set up my work, I was looking for local history. But what I actually found through this source, this spatial and textual source, the shrine and hagiography of Shah Musafir, the traveler king, as his name means, led me, in fact, to my first ventures into world history and to grapple with my first world historical source text. That text then, and indeed the burial place here, were related to two migrants, Shah Musafir and his own teacher, Palang Push, the wearer of the leopard skin, who traveled, walked no less, all the way from Bukhara in Central Asia, now Uzbekistan, to Aurangabad, which is briefly the capital of the Mughal Empire in the late 17th century. They were part, as I came to understand, of a larger pattern of Sufi migration routes out of Central Asia, moving from cities like Bukhara, but also other places in what's now northern Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, to some extent Turkestan, and moving westwards into West Asia, what's now Turkey, and southwards into South Asia, what's now India and Pakistan. A process that was not linked to the movement of religious and Sufi teachings, but also part of a much wider export of a cultural package that I'll call Persianate, something I'll move to a little later in my talk. The text itself then, the Malfuzat in Akshbandir, the hagiography, the biography of Shah Musafir in principle, was more than the biography of a single person, which was what made it, I think, a world historical text. Because it described not only the migration of Shah Musafir, the traveler saint, the traveler king, from Bukhara to Central Asia, but described through the collection, essentially, of oral histories by its writer in the 1680s to early 1700s, of a whole cast of otherwise unknown characters from all ranks of society. This was, in a sense, world history meets social history. What's more, the stories of those figures survived because they were, in this text, in this hagiography, as it were, fastened to the hem of the saint's robes to survive the obliteration of time. And indeed, that text itself survived in one singular manuscript copy until it was printed in the 1940s in the shrine itself, which protected in turn the text that protected the stories of all those various figures. And who were those figures then? They were the various migrants from Central Asia, Turanis, as they were called in the Persian language of the period, who had moved from Central Asia to that great source, a brief source of opportunity, the capital of the Mughal Empire in South India. That text then not only told me about the cosmopolitan frontier society of 17th century Aurangabad, it also had a function within its own time and place. And in subsequent times, in that place, that was why it was written. What do I mean? It served, the text served to tell the descendants of those migrants who they were, where they'd come from, and how they got there. To my mind then, this is an exemplary world historical source partly because it's so semantically dense. It's a polyphonic text full of different voices, different people's stories, often told in their own language through quotations, as it were. It contains emic and etic levels of reading. It can be read as a source document by historians such as myself, 
but nonetheless is and was read by the descendants of those migrants. When I was living in Aurangabad, an Urdu translation was made, so people still in Aurangabad today were able to read it. And also, crucially, it connected different places, distant Central Asia and southern India, through the constant and, context, uh, and, and complex interplay of text and territory, shrine and hagiography, Bukhara on Aurangabad. Let me turn to my second source, the diary of Mirza Saleh Shirazi. Mirza Saleh Shirazi was one of a group of six Muslim students who came from Iran in 1815 to study the new sciences, the ulumi jadid, as they were called, or the ulumi farangi, the European sciences, the products of the scientific revolution of the 18th and early 19th century. They were, that party of six students, in fact, the first ever Muslim students to come and study in the West. Indeed, some of the earliest ever Asian students to ever do so. I located that text. It was known to various uh, Iranian scholars. It had been published in Iran several times, but never translated. But for myself, at least, I found that text when I was living in Oxford. And in fact, what interested me initially, suffering as I was from uh, um, that sense that many people have in Oxford, that Oxford is the center of the world, <laughs> I was struck by a description. In fact, quite a disparaging district description of uh, the pomp and circumstance of an Oxford ceremony. When I left Oxford, for my valedictory gesture, I translated it for the Oxford Journal. <laughs> but as I read more into the text, and I dug deeper into it, I realized that there was actually a lot more going on. That Oxford, important as that was, as a center of intellectual networks that are, after all, a part of what world historians might focus on. That Mirza Saleh was an explorer, an ethnographer, an intellectual pioneer. Together with his five companions, he was attempting nothing less than to transfer the scientific revolution to the Middle East. And in order to do so, and this was in many ways what was so important about this text itself, and having a text, a first-hand personal record, a diary of that process, was that it required all kinds of social interaction. Some of them socially, morally, culturally challenging, some of them more fun, going to many balls. It was, after all, Jane Austen's period, and his chaperone was the real Mr. Darcy. And yet the diary gave a micro view on various macro processes, as I've suggested, of technological transfer, of comparative development and divergence, of what the German world historian Sebastian Conrad has called the global enlightenment, or I might add, its constraints and its limits. And those constraints and those limits were only understandable by looking at the very real challenges that these pioneering six students from the Middle East faced in trying to do something that is easy to say in a word, technology transfer, much more difficult to do in practice, particularly in a period when there was not so much even as an English to Persian dictionary by which they might be able to learn English or indeed to be able to translate and thereby transfer the scientific manuals that they're reading and transfer that knowledge to Iran. There wasn't even, in a sense, a modern or comparable equivalent scientific lexicon in which they could translate those books. It was a grand task then. After all, when Mirza Salim's companions left Iran, there was no modern industry of the kind that Mirza Salim's companions described and tried to take back through their apprenticeships. There was no modern chemistry of the kind that one of the students studied. There's no machine making modern weaponry of the kind that another of the students learned to master, nor there was even a printing press. Mr. Saleh took one back with him to Iran with the other scientific instruments his companions took with him, hoping to become the Gutenberg of Iran. In the meantime, someone had brought a printing press, another Mirza from Russia. What I learned then, at least as a kind of world historical text here, is, is how to understand the human and social texture of technological and intellectual interchange across large regions of the world. And something that I think only that micro-historical approach and a source such as that diary might show us. Let me move on to my concept and move from science and scientific networks to literary and cultural networks. And that concept then, we've looked at two sources as ways into world history and approaching that dilemma of scale. Now I want to look at a concept and the way historians can use their conceptual apparatus too, to do world history. 
The concept then is that of the Persian at world. And remember that non-national scales is, as it were, the calling card of the world historian. Well, what we have here is evidently a spatial concept. World historians use other spatial concepts. The Indian Ocean world is another of the best known. And this is also an etic concept. That's to say it's a concept that is developed by historians and wasn't actually used by Persian speakers themselves, whether in the medieval, early modern, or indeed modern and larger the contemporary period. The term was coined by the Chicago pioneering world historian of the 1960s, Marshall Hodson, a great admirer himself of Ibn Khaldun. And he defined the term Persianate. He preferred, he used the word Persianate zone rather than Persianate world. He designed, uh, defined the Persianate world or Persianate zone as a region influenced by the Persian language and by the wider cultural package carried by Persian literature and indeed by the cultural uh, uh, forms expressed in that literature. Persianate languages then weren't Persian as such, but rather languages influenced and shaped by Persian. Literatures that evolved under the shadow, no less of Persian. Important literatures and languages like Urdu, Chaktai Turkish of Central Asia, Pashto, Ottoman Turkish, or even in more complex ways, languages uh, in at least a certain phase of their history, such as Georgian and Armenian. The concept of the Persian world then points us to a geography of interaction, that's to say a world historical geography, in which in this case was defined, its parameters were defined by the use of Persian as a trans-regional contact language. I should say thanks to Seher Beg, my graduate student, for making this, uh, uh, this map for me. It's beyond my, my scale. The Persian world then stretched, as we can see here, from London to Beijing. All of the places marked upon this map were sites where Persian texts were written, or at the very least read, over the period of around 1000 uh, to around 1900 CE. The Persian world then as a concept serves as a heuristic tool, marking a conceptual space, or at least a set of, net or at least a set of networks within that space that were created by the common use of Persian as a means of communication. Again, as I've said, stretching quite literally, let me emphasize that point. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of Persian documents that survive in the National Archives of Beijing, still to this day, from the Qing and Ming period, largely. And also, kind of probably more than that, no doubt more than that, in London. And the Persian world also stretched north to south, from Siberia, those towns like Tobolsk we have marked on there, right down to Gala, where there's a stone erected, in fact, by Zheng He, the famous Chinese uh, Muslim traveler of the 14th century, left a trilingual stone in Tamil, Persian, um, and Chinese. Persian then was a cosmopolitan, or at least a pluralistic language. In fact, the earliest inscription, the earliest form of the writing of Persian, that's to say modern Persian, Farsi, that we have written in anywhere, in any form that survived, is in fact this inscription at Tange Azau, high in the mountains of central Afghanistan. There's only one photograph of it. It was actually taken by an exped expedition in the 1950s. It's still so remote, even today. And this inscription, dating from 751, the earliest written form of Farsi, modern Farsi as we know today, uh, New Persian, as linguists would call it, was written not in the Arabic script, but in the Hebrew script by Jewish merchants, Persian-speaking, crossing Afghanistan. In later centuries, many Hindu and Sikh authors would use Persian, albeit by then having adopted the Arabic script. And of course, Persian was also the language of numerous Muslim authors stretching across Eurasia. By the late 18th century, it was taken up by the British East India Company that used Persian as its language of administration throughout its Indian domains until um, 1837. And in fact, in my own hometown of Birmingham, Matthew Bolton, the inventor of the uh, steam engine, someone, or at least a, a mechanism, which Mirza Sali, our Persian traveler, was greatly interested in, himself started minting Persian coins for the East India Company beginning in 1786. And over the subsequent 20 years, no fewer than 220 million coins in Persian were minted in Birmingham for export to India. A Persian world indeed. Traces still survive 
throughout the English language today, as they do throughout many languages. So next time you're sitting, sipping a mint julep on a veranda, eating candy, think that there are three Persian words in that sentence. I'll leave you to work out which ones they are. My second concept then, the tariqa, an Arabic word this time that means a Sufi path or a Sufi order, alternatively a lineage of masters. All of those meanings are clustered together in its dense semantic concept. concept. It literally means the way, a kind of a road. In Arabic term then, but also an emic concept. That's to say a concept used by historical actors themselves, not a concept like the Persian world that has been, one might say, imposed upon or used by historians to understand those historical actors. And in contrast to the spatial concept of Persian world, the tariqa is a temporal concept, or at least a temporal and a spatial concept. What we have here is the, a document which is the a genealogical tree, a shajara, a tree in, in Arabic, a genealogical tree of a Sufi lineage. This is actually one of those tariqas, one of those uh, lineages, one of those orders, one of those genealogies of masters, that's all the same thing, in written form. And what we usually have here is the initiatory lineage going over centuries, but also crossing across large geographies that link a Sufi master in the present all the way back to the prophet Muhammad over the generations. What this serves as then is not merely a source, but an explanatory tool that tells a community themselves, or tells several interlinked communities, how to organize their past, their historical identity, over vast distances, and indeed over vast stretches of time. What we have here is nothing less than a genealogical map of time, of initiatic generations, what was often called by Sufis themselves a golden chain, a more of a, as an etic concept, the tariqa, that's to say an in, a concept used by historical actors, in this case Muslim believers themselves, it's not a map of um, secular time, it's a map of sacred time, taking them back all the way to the Prophet Muhammad, to the year one of the Islamic calendar, to the beginning of Muslim time. But it's also, as I've hinted, a map of space. This is how we might transfer that onto a more familiar map in our cartographical terms. Because a genealogy document like that shows how different Muslim communities in the middle of India, or perhaps the middle of Indonesia, or Africa, how they imaginatively, conceptually, memnonically connect themselves to the wider world of fellow Muslim believers and to Mecca as indeed in the case here of one of the Sufis I worked on in South Africa. Well, let's move then to a second process, this time, and so, uh, sorry, uh, from uh, concepts then, let's move to a process, translation. And this is a multifaceted process, process. It's key, but I think neglected in world history. Because languages and written sources more generally have often been sidelined in the big picture historiography, in the universal history mode of world history. And yet the process of translation, cultural as well as linguistic translation, is essential to see how different worlds, different parts of the world interact. It's essential to the key business of world history. In my own work, I've ventured into a few projects that I might classify under something like the Muslim understanding of Buddhism. Taking us then beyond an approach like Toynbee's of looking at discrete civilizations, each with their own volume or half volume in his magnum opus, but rather looking at how different civilizations interacted and understood one another. This then can be, in many ways, a kind of beyond Eurocentrism approach to world history, because in this case, in a document like this, we have an Indian Muslim trying to understand the religiosity of the inhabitants of Burma. I hesitated to say there, Buddhism, because what was precisely interesting about this text, Sayyidi Barma, literally means the a journey in Burma, a journey to Burma, what was so interesting about the con the, the, this text was that its author had no concept of Buddhism, had no notion that there was a world historical figure a founder of a world religion called the Buddha. In fact, this text was the closest thing 
a historian of social scientists might come to a control experiment because it looked at how an Indian Muslim, educated Indian Muslim, turns up in a new environment and tries to understand a culture, a religion from scratch with no prior knowledge, no preconceptions for better or worse. What he actually described then was not Buddhism, but what he called the Madhabi Burma, simply the religion of Burma. And through the text, after all, this was a printed document. Printing spread to the Islamic world only in the 19th century and then um, expanded very widely, particularly in, in late colonial India. So through this text, we see not only someone trying to understand a different religious system from first principles for himself, but also trying to work out how to explain that, how to explain the Mazhabi Barama, what we will call Buddhism, to Muslim readers with no prior knowledge of who the Buddha was or what this religion might be. Translation, then, as a complex process of interaction, intellectual, not merely the exchange of trade goods, let's say, which has dominated so much of world history. Another way in which I've recently tried to trace this development then, this kind of inter-religious uh, intellectual history, was by looking at the translations made in Afghanistan by Afghan scholars in the 1920s and 30s, translations made uh, of French archaeological reports into Dari Persian that allowed Afghans to reconstruct their own sense of their past and in many ways to, to, uh, 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 to go about what I call in one of my articles the Afghan discovery of Buddhism. But what was actually happening here was again a complex process of translation. Not only the translation of French archaeological reports into Dari Persian, as in the text on the left, but actually the translation of French translations of the Chinese ancient histories of Sima Qian and the Chinese Buddhist pilgrim travelogue of Xuanzang from, French, from Chinese into French and through French into Persian. Just last month, I made a research trip to Japan. I was delighted to find an Urdu translation this time of Xuanzang, this time not from Chinese to French into Persian, but from Chinese to English into Urdu. Appropriately, that was in a Japanese library where it had been gifted by a Pakistani scholar. And found by a British American or something. Hmm? That points me then to the last of my examples of this complex process of translation as a process that's key to the endeavor of world history with the Muslim encounter with Japan. In the later 19th and the first half of the 20th century, there are numerous attempts by Arab, Malay, Iranian, Indian Muslims to understand how Japan had managed to modernize, so much so as to defeat the major European power, the Russian Empire, in the Japanese-Russian War of 1903-4, how Japan had modernized itself by translating European scientific knowledge and transferring that scientific knowledge through its own universities to its population at large. A number of Muslim intellectuals were sent to Japan to try to understand then how this translation process worked. So they were themselves. Translation then becomes, again, not just an emic, con an etic concept that I as a historian impose on my materials, but it's something that my historical actors themselves interested and deeply invested in. A figure like Sayyid Ross Masood here. If the name's familiar, it's because he's better known, at least better known as the West, as the figure to whom E.M. Forster dedicated a passage to India, a close friend of Forster. And here he is as a Japanophile in Japanese robes. The problem was that he couldn't speak Japanese. The only people he could speak to in Japan were those who spoke English, which he'd learned at Oxford. Oxford centrism again, I hate me. But still, what we glimpse in works such as his, 400-page history of Japan, an account of its modernization, of its universities. He was the education minister for uh, Hyderabad State, which in 1918 founded the first vernacular language university in India, Osmani University. And he was sent on a mission to try to understand how the Japanese had managed to translate European textbooks, create universities, and crucially, create a scientific lexicon in their own language for terms and concepts, scientific terms and concepts that didn't exist before. Think about it. How do you manage to explain a process to someone, a scientific experiment, let's say, if there are no words in your language to explain the very key things, the instruments, the, the procedures for doing that. 
What we see here then in this page here that I've pulled out from another Urdu account of Japan from, in this case, the 1930s, a decade later, is a complex tripartite translation process. Captured here then in this trilingual vocabulary page where we have Japanese vocabulary translated into Urdu but rendered phonetically in Arabic script and then in the English script. And in a few cases in this vocabulary, we'll find English words that have in turn crept into Japan and we're now coming back into Urdu. Translation then as crucial to the actual procedures, the interactions that are so central to world history. I'd suggest that intellectual history is the new challenge for world historians. Translation is where mind meets matter. It's where the human perception of the world that defines people's engagement and activity of the world and its other inhabitants. It explains, translation explains how ideas and ideologies do and don't travel, how they translate and transfer, or how they don't. Translation helps us explain the uneven unity and division of the world to this day. Well, as I move to my conclusions then, summoning Blake and Borges, two literary figures whom I've invoked today, looking at the individual translated documents that I just showed a moment ago, looking at these words in motion, brings me back then to the title and theme of my talk today. To quote William Blake's line in context, or at least a little in extenso, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity, in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Pausing in bewilderment at Borges's infinite library, or even at the contents of the YRL, Blake's words remind us that it is possible to comprehend the biggest of pictures, the largest of scales, infinity, eternity even, by the careful scrutiny of small pieces of the whole, a grain of sand, a wild flower, or perhaps the diary of a Persian student, or the genealogical tariqa of an African Sufi. I hope I've shown today some ways in which we can all, as world citizens, confront and overcome the dilemma of scale, and so make sense of the wider world around us. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Niall, so much for that fascinating and very erudite, of course, talk. Um, we're not going to have questions right now, but we do hope that the conversation will continue outside uh, in the lobby area where there will be a reception set up. So we hope that you can come out and uh, ask uh, your questions there, introduce yourself to the speaker, and um, thank our donor uh, along with the rest of us. Thank you.